The world of Arcane is so well realized and full of life. Everything from the city streets to the styles of clothing that people wear tells you something about the world that they inhabit. From the bright pristine rooftops of Piltover to the constricting gaseous fissures of the Undercity. The sleek 1920s art deco angular architecture of Piltover contrasts brilliantly with the rounder art nouveau slash industrial style of the Undercity, with a healthy splash of punk style thrown in there for good measure. The visual storytelling is phenomenal, and the amount of detail crammed into these environments is often staggering, which makes it even more impressive that the characters of Arcane are still the highlight of the show. Characters like Jinx or Vi are so incredibly well written that people have made dozens of video essays about these two characters alone. But while searching for more Arcane videos to watch, I noticed that something was missing. Where are all the Caitlyn videos? When typing her name into YouTube, you only really get scene packs or videos that solely focus on Caitlyn through her relationship with Vi. It's surprising to me that so many YouTubers are just content to talk about one aspect of Caitlyn's character. And that got me curious. Why is that? Caitlyn is a primary character of Arcane. She has, like, the fourth highest amount of screen time out of the entire cast. She's hugely important to Arcane's story and is a big driving force through Acts 2 and 3. For most of the first season, Caitlyn is the only topsider who doesn't buy into all of Piltover's bullcrap. Her frustration with the complacency of the people in power leads her to seek answers, and her curiosity leads her to some very startling realizations that force her to confront her own biases. She's the character that arguably has the most growth over the course of the show, and yet she's reduced to the role of Vi's girlfriend in the fandom mind. She's extremely underrated and overlooked, and that's precisely why she's one of my favorite characters in the show. Arcane's story shows that in a society plagued by ignorance and complacency, the only way to actually solve problems is to be curious enough to be looking for the solutions. And no character embodies this concept more than our sweet cupcake, Caitlin. All these thoughts keep me up at night. Yeah. What am I doing? Did I do it right? Yeah. All these thoughts keep me up at night. Yeah. I can't pay straight, need the light. All these thoughts keep me up at night. Yeah. What am I doing? Did I do it right? Yeah. All these thoughts keep me up at night. Yeah. I can't pay straight, need the light. Caitlin Kierman being a well-rounded character is a fact often overlooked in the Arcane fandom in favor of focusing on her status as Vi's love interest, and I'd argue that's a very reductive way to look at her. Caitlin's smart, competent, undervalued, overqualified, daring, observant, and funny all at the same time. Caitlin's voice actor Katie Lung is also so good at making the audience feel for her character while simultaneously making us chuckle at her dorkiness. Last year didn't he launch a blimp halfway across the continent? Airship, actually. An airship has a rigid metal hull. It's not a blimp. The answer is here, staring me in the face. I can feel it. My parents named me Matilda after my great-grandmother Matilda the... Caitlyn in Act 1 is a minor character, but very quickly in Act 2 she is established as a major player. Arcane does a good job of shuffling its large cast of characters around. In Act 1, Caitlyn is barely present. She is in three short scenes and has no relation to the main plot, unlike Vi, Jace, Victor, or Powder. In Act 1, Vi and Vander are major players, but by Act 2, Vi is missing and Vander is dead, so they shift focus to Caitlyn, who's been a secondary character up until now. She becomes the main driver of the plot through Act 2. She investigates the attack at the airship docks, she is the one who witnesses Jinx at the fairground attack, and she is the one piecing the clues together while everyone else is focused on the individual issues. The show does such a good job shuffling their characters around, mixing and mingling them in ways that are interesting and unexpected. Who expected Vi and Jace of all characters to team up for an episode? Or Echo and Heimerdinger? Or Victor and Dr. Singed? The writers turned an Act 1 minor character into a main character in Act 2 just by shuffling the cast around for one episode. Arcane has what's called an ensemble cast, where there are many principal characters and the focus perspective changes around to give each of those characters as much screen time as possible. The role of main character almost gets tossed around between the various cast members depending on whose arc is being explored in the episode. And despite this, Caitlyn doesn't seem to garner too much attention. Despite being a part of the main cast, I haven't actually seen many video essays dissecting Caitlyn as a character. Most videos talk about her in the context of her relationship to Vi and why it works, 
which is awesome and I will also be covering their relationship in this video as well, but Caitlyn isn't just a love interest for Vi. She is a very compelling character on her own, arguably one of the most compelling as she goes through a ton of growth over the course of the season. So let's talk about that growth, starting with her first moments on screen. Caitlin's family, the Kiramans, are wealthy nobility in Piltover. Her father appears to be a doctor of sorts, while her mother seems to be more of the head of the family, as she serves as a governing official on Piltover's council. Caitlin grew up rich, but despite her status as nobility, she wants to serve the city, solve crimes, and keep the peace. She's not satisfied with the sheltered life she's been given. And unrelated to the rest of this essay, I also just want to say that it's cool to see that Caitlin comes from a mixed-race family. Her mom's white and her dad's Asian. Or Ionian, if we're talking league lore. I just read that on the wiki, don't at me. Like, being mixed-race myself, it's just cool to see Asian mixed-race characters in the media I enjoy. It's just nice to feel represented a little. Caitlin starts off the story from a place of curiosity. Her actual first line of dialogue is a question. You really went to the Undercity to get these? Weren't you afraid? A lot of the time in this show, a character's first words are representative of a major part of their story, like Jace's A little danger is worth the risk, don't you think? or Echo's Give me a few seconds. are very symbolic of their overall stories. Jace's whole story revolves around throwing caution to the wind for the sake of discovery, while Echo's story is mostly about the passage of time and how he wishes he could undo the events of the past. Good dialogue is a means to establish character. Caitlin's first words are posed as a curious question about the Undercity, a place that she's heard of but never been to herself. Even as a child, she is very interested in the larger world beyond Piltover's borders. She's grown up in a very sheltered and structured environment, raised in the highest echelons of Piltover's nobility with no idea of how the other people of Piltover live. Caitlin has very few scenes in the first act of Arcane, but they're very formative, establishing moments, and they're crucial to understanding her later characterization. During the scene after Jace is found guilty, Caitlin tells Jace, Your name's no good now. My dad says you're a misfit, and that we can't be friends anymore. So why are you out here? I'm a misfit too, I suppose. Caitlin feels like a misfit due to her not liking the underhanded tactics that her society, and especially her parents, use to control things. As we see throughout the whole show, Piltover is full of two-faced manipulators. The counselors manipulate each other all the time in order to reach their own ends. Caitlin's parents go behind her back to manipulate her career and sabotage her independence. She even goes on to assume that her parents manipulated her shooting competition and paid her competitor to let her win. But to Caitlyn's surprise, Grayson openly says she wasn't paid and just thought Caitlyn deserved to win. She presents open and honest communication and Caitlyn takes this to heart. Similarly, she admires Jace as a friend because of his honesty. During Act 1, when he's found guilty of his crimes, Jace has the opportunity to let the truth slip away. He could have listened to Heimerdinger and gotten a slap on the wrist if he just lied, but instead he was punished for telling the truth. Caitlin clearly prefers honesty from people. She's influenced by honest inventors like Jace and honorable soldiers like Grayson to think about her place in the world and what she can do to contribute to it. These figures fuel her desire for knowledge and truth. Her curiosity and her desire for truth are what compel her through the later acts of the story. Between Acts 1 and 2, there's a time jump that allows the younger cast to age up. At the beginning of Act 2, Caitlin is reintroduced as an enforcer, one of the law enforcement officers who serve Piltover's people. However, she is introduced in uniform, but standing guard outside her mother's fair tent. With resentment, she tells Jace, She'd do anything to keep me from seeing the real world. Note that she doesn't just say the world, she says the real world. This indicates that she's at least somewhat aware that reality, the real world, is not the cushy, sheltered life that surrounds her. She knows that there's more to life than just coasting along on her family's noble status. Caitlin rebels in small ways against her overbearing mother, mainly by pursuing a career in law enforcement, an arguably low-class and dangerous career unbefitting a lady of her status. She becomes an enforcer partly to disobey her mother, but mostly to satisfy her deep curiosity about the world at large that she's never seen before. Law enforcement officers are supposed to be keepers of the peace and seekers of truth, after all. 
Caitlin wants to be of service. She wants to solve cases and thwart shadowy organizations that threaten Piltover's safety, but she encounters barrier after barrier that have been put in her way. Her mother uses her considerable influence to position Caitlin as far away from conflict as possible, and when Caitlin disobeys orders and investigates on her own, Marcus, the corrupt sheriff, intervenes and uses his own authority to dismiss her and punishes her for stepping out of line. Like her mother, Marcus is an authority figure to Caitlin, and like her mother, Marcus uses his influence to keep her away from the truth, the real world that she is so desperately seeking. It's the events of the Progress Day bombing that push Caitlyn over the edge. During the bombing, Caitlyn nearly gets killed, along with six other officers, and a top-secret piece of Hextech is stolen. But most importantly, Caitlin witnesses who the bomber was. Caitlin knows that the Shimmer smugglers were connected to the bombing because of the symbols she found while she was investigating on her own. This would normally be enough evidence to suggest a grander conspiracy, but with Marcus in charge, Caitlin knows that she would just hit another dead end. She knows that she can't go to Marcus without proof, and it just so happens that she knows of a potential eyewitness. A witness who, if he cooperates, could blow her whole case wide open and provide the proof she needs of a greater conspiracy involved Involving the Undercity. And thankfully, that witness is safe and sound in Stillwater Prison. <laughs> or not. Caitlin learns that her witness was beaten nearly to death by another inmate, and so she asks herself, who would have done that? Also, how would another prisoner have done that? Have you seen this guy? He's fucking massive. He's big McFuck huge. Who could have possibly taken him down? Who the hell are you? God, I love this entrance. It's the perfect reveal for our missing girl and gives Caitlyn more questions as well as actual answers. Caitlyn is the only one who sees the attack on the square for what it is, a criminal element overstepping their bounds, and against regulations she goes to seek answers at Stillwater, and what she finds is Vi. Vi has no record of her imprisonment, no record of her name or her crimes. She was just thrown into a cell and made to disappear. This immediately raises questions in Caitlyn's mind. At first, Vi refuses to answer her questions, but the moment that Caitlyn presents her evidence to Vi, she's instantly invested in Caitlyn's line of questioning. It's clear to her that Vi recognizes the drawing in this photograph and knows what's going on. It's also clear to Caitlyn that Vi was thrown in prison likely because she knows what's going on. This whole situation reeks of corruption, so without trying to use some underhanded tactic to manipulate Vi into helping her, Caitlyn takes a chance on Vi. Caitlyn does things directly. She's a straight shooter. Straight shooter. <laughs> straight shooter. <laughs> I, I promise this isn't the only straight joke I'm going to be making in this video. Caitlyn's curiosity combined with her straightforward method for solving problems makes her an excellent investigator. Vi even tells her later on that it's impressive how much she's managed to figure out about the Shimmer plot without even going to the Undercity. And it's ultimately her curiosity that allows her to come face to face with her biggest flaw, her ignorance. I think it goes without saying, but Caitlyn Kierman is an extremely privileged person in the world of Arcane. She comes from one of the wealthiest and most powerful families in one of the most prosperous cities in the world. She's lived her whole life surrounded by fortune and favor, and because of Caitlyn's place of privilege, she starts off very ignorant of the world beyond Piltover's borders, beyond the surface of Piltover's politics. And that isn't her fault, she was born into a society where she wasn't allowed to venture beyond the socially constructed boundaries that her family placed around her. Caitlyn expresses her frustration about how hard it is for her to get any real answers from people and that's partially because she's extremely privileged and used to getting what she wants. As a girl, she wanted her parents to help Jace, and they did so. She wanted to win her shooting competition, and Grayson let her win. Vi pretty much spells it out here. You know what your problem is? Please, tell me. You expect everyone to give you what you want. It's right there in the text. This is an entitled way of acting, because Caitlyn is used to having life handed to her on a silver platter. What she's always wanted was the hard stuff, the real world that she was denied for so long by her mother. And it doesn't come easily to her because of her privileged upbringing. Ch -ch 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 your privilege. Her ignorance is not her fault. But that doesn't make Caitlyn completely blameless for the things she says and does. When Vi proposes the idea of helping Caitlyn find proof of Silco being the mastermind behind the entire Shimmer plot, she responds, In what mad world would I trust someone like you? Someone like me? 
and Vi takes that personally. This is the first instance that Caitlyn is forced to confront her place of privilege. She's normally so sure of herself and of the intentions of those around her, and in this moment she wonders, could I be wrong? Caitlyn, like many people in society, assumes that because someone is in jail, that must mean that they've already done something to deserve being there. Their current state of punishment must be proof that they've done something worth punishing. But this doesn't seem to be the case for Vi. She has no record. And because of this, Caitlyn starts to question her preconceived notions of criminality and guilt. To further this line of thought, when she goes to seek Vi's release, the warden assumes that she wants him and his guards to go beat the shit out of her. Caitlyn is not only against this idea, but is shocked to learn that this has happened many, many times over the years that Vi's been imprisoned here. It further challenges Caitlyn's worldview. In this case, the idea that those who are incarcerated may not only be innocent, but are also facing violent abuse from prison officials. This is true to real life. A study published in 2007 was conducted in Ohio where nearly 800 police officers, attorneys, and judges were interviewed and told to give an estimated number of how many innocent people across the United States they thought were wrongly convicted. The vast majority of them said more than zero, but less than 5%. As of March 2023, there were or are approximately 1.9 million incarcerated people in the American prison system. If we go with the low end of that study's estimate, that is 0.5%, half of 1% of prisoners are innocent? then that means that 9,500 people are currently in prison for crimes they did not commit. Finding an exact number of wrongfully convicted people in the United States is almost impossible. You'd have to review the records from every single court and prison across all federal, state, and county levels. And even then, most cases that receive convictions never went to trial. They resulted in plea bargains. A plea bargain is a legal agreement between the prosecutor and the defendant, where the defendant agrees to plead guilty to their charges, usually in exchange for a lighter sentence. This process helps streamline the incarceration process by skipping a lengthy trial period and going right to sentencing. Trials take time and can cost the defendant a lot of money. Money that they don't often have, since the majority of defendants are living below the poverty line. An estimated one-fourth of all incarcerated prisoners in the United States aren't even serving jail time. They're being held pre-trial because they can't afford to pay fines or bail. So they take the plea bargain, because even if they are innocent, fighting their case could bankrupt them, and during that whole period, they're going to be incarcerated in prison anyway. The types of court cases you see in Law & Order yeah, those are fictional. Those almost never happen in real life. The American Bar Association estimates that about 95% of all convictions are done through plea bargains and not trials. 95% of all people in the United States were not given a guilty verdict handed down by a jury of their peers. The American justice system is designed to streamline convictions, not to give a fair trial. It's a factory line, producing as many convictions as possible and forgetting about them just as quickly. Piltover seems to function much the same way. When someone gets arrested, they get thrown in prison and get forgotten by those in power. Remember Big McF*** Huge? After Caitlyn gets Vi out of prison, he's completely forgotten by the narrative, but also by the people in power. Jace becomes a counselor and learns about the attack at the Hex Gates. He knows there was an eyewitness in Stillwater Hold. Does he ever request to see him? Nope. Out of sight, out of mind. Vi even confronts Jace about this very topic. I could have you arrested. You ever been to Stillwater? No. So you just wave an arm, have someone dragged off, don't bother to find out what it does to someone being stuffed in a stone box for weeks or months or even years? And Jace has no defense. He just shifts the conversation to a different topic. Privileged people often don't think about what their privilege affords them, because if they do stop to think about it for more than a minute, it makes them extremely uncomfortable. The fact that you or I take freedom for granted while millions of people suffer in prison for crimes they may or may not have committed is fucking depressing. But Caitlin confronts the reality that she has been ignorant of a lot of the city's problems for her entire life. Vi is living, breathing proof that her worldview is false. She can't ignore that. And Caitlin's inquisitive mind makes her wonder, if her preconceived notions of criminality are wrong, what else might she be wrong about? When she and Vi scale down the water tower, Caitlin doesn't realize at first that this place, this ramshackled hut, 
is Vi's childhood home. It's not even a hut, really. It's more like a shack. The, the thing doesn't even have a roof. The extreme level of poverty that people who live in the Fishers deal with is nigh unthinkable to Caitlin. So it comes as a surprise when she learns that this is where Vi and Powder grew up. Caitlin asks questions to Vi here, and look, I love Caitlin, but these are easily her worst moments. How do you not know if your sister is alive or dead? Like, bitch, Vi's been in solitary confinement on an island for upwards of seven years. Questions like... What? You don't have parents? Show how much Caitlyn takes the very basics of family security for granted. She's never struggled, not really. She's always had a full stomach, a proper education, a large bed to sleep in, a warm house, and a loving family to welcome her home and care for her. It's here in the lowest part of the Undercity where Caitlyn is forced to come face to face with her ignorance. When Vi tells her that her parents were killed by enforcers, the very police force that Caitlyn serves, she doesn't deny it. She can't. This is Vi's lived experience, and now she starts to understand why people of the Undercity, like Vi, hate people like her and the other topsiders so much. Through Vi, here at the deepest level of the Undercity, Caitlyn is confronted by the terrible state of Piltover. Its people are starving and sick, being abused and exploited by crime lords, while also being mistreated and killed by the city's police force. And all the while, they are ignored by their government. These people have no one to turn to. These people need help. The city needs to change. This is not how it was intended to be. This is a failure of the system, and Caitlin quickly realizes that. Her time spent with Vi, someone who she started diametrically opposed to in every way, opened up her mind to the idea that her worldview is extremely narrow and very wrong. Exposure to the undeniable reality that her city is flawed forced her to confront her preconceived notions and realize that she has been living in blissful ignorance for her entire life. And as she comes to these realizations, she also comes to realize that she is developing feelings for Vi. Over the course of the first season of Arcane, Caitlyn starts to fall for Vi. This romance is hinted at throughout League lore, but as far as I'm aware, the two have always been canonically crime-fighting partners and nothing more. Their relationship has never been directly addressed until Arcane. I just read that on the wiki, don't at me. This romance is fascinating to a lot of viewers, as Vi and Caitlyn, as I've stated before, are at total odds with each other. Vi is a tough brawler from the Undercity and a convict, while Caitlyn is an inquisitive enforcer and nobility from Piltover. These two start out diametrically opposed, but through the experiences they share and the things that Caitlyn learns about her, Caitlyn becomes enamored by Vi's presence. The scene everyone talks about is the one in the brothel. When they go to the brothel looking for information, you can tell that the entire time they are there, Caitlyn has never been to a place like this before. She's clearly so uncomfortable, but at the same time, maybe a little aroused and a little curious? A little bi curious, huh? This scene is not only funny because Vi is being a bit of a pig, checking her out, hitting on her the way she does, but it shows a great dynamic between Caitlyn and Vi. You're hot, cupcake. Someone checking her out and being this direct with her catches her totally off guard. It's also clearly a game for Vi. She catches this pampered princess off guard and finds her reaction cute and funny. Caitlyn, I think, starts to fall for Vi here. Before this point, Caitlyn and Vi's relationship has been tenuous at best. Caitlyn took a chance on Vi getting her released, and so far they've done nothing but bicker every chance they get. You almost got me killed. My little sister could do that when she was seven. All us Fisher folk can. Don't you want to blend in? We're here because I'm hungry. Do you know what prison food is like? I knew this was a terrible idea. You don't actually know anything, do you? But their first meeting went nearly the same as this. The way Vi talks with Caitlyn is unlike any other person she knows in Piltover. Vi doesn't respect Caitlyn's status, and she certainly doesn't talk to her like she's an uppity noblewoman. Vi talks to her like a normal person. She calls out Caitlyn's privilege whenever she says something stupid, and she speaks playfully but directly to her. During the brothel scene, Vi is still on the fence about Caitlyn, uncertain of whether she's trustworthy or not, which is why she ditches her to go pursue her real lead. However, the exchange still sparks interest, because after Vi talks to the madam of the brothel, she spots Caitlyn flirting with one of the brothel girls. And Vi gets this little smirk, like, huh, Caitlyn's into girls too. 
Cool. I remember I audibly snorted because it became so obvious she was into her at this point. That mutual sense of attraction is there. During their time spent together in the Fishers, that's when Caitlin really starts to learn about who Vi is as a person and what she's been through. She learns about Vi's childhood and she meets Huck, an old friend of Vi's from when Vander was still around. I, I owed her old man my life. <laughs> Probably more than that. Huck very clearly wants to help Vi, and you don't gain that sort of reverence or respect by being an asshole, even though he rats them out later to Silco, but that's not important. Caitlin appreciates Vi for her honesty. She's incredibly direct, sometimes too direct, often rushing head-on into fights and getting the shit beaten out of her. But we love her for it. It's a quality that makes Vi endearing, especially to someone like Caitlin who values honesty and curiosity. Arcane does a great job of showing characters' personalities through their fighting style and choice of weapon. Caitlyn is direct and to the point so she has a rifle. Vi is confrontational and aggressive so she has giant metal boxing gloves. Jinx is unpredictable and disastrous so explosives are her thing. Jace reacts to all his problems by squashing them quickly like a blunt instrument so he wields a hammer. It's just another small detail that really shows off how these characters behave. Vi wants the truth as badly as Caitlyn does and Caitlyn kind of falls in love with her for that. She's as curious and honest as she is and unlike anyone she ever met back in Piltover. Caitlyn even starts adopting traits of Vi that she finds admirable. When they return to the surface, Caitlyn doesn't hold back when fighting with her mother. It's citizens living on the streets, being poisoned, having to choose between a kingpin who wants to exploit them in a government that doesn't give a shit. Oh, Caitlyn! And this direct approach bizarrely gets her mother to listen to her. Somewhere deep down, Caitlyn's mother knows that she's right. Her daughter now has more experience with the Undercity than anyone she knows, and it's worth trying to get the rest of the council to try and hear her out. Caitlyn wanted to see the real world, and Vi is as real as anyone gets. This makes their emotional breakup all the more heartbreaking, because Vi is truly the first person that Caitlyn's ever been able to be completely open and honest with. Vi listens to her. Vi cares about her thoughts and ideas, and Vi truly believes in her in spite of the fact that Caitlyn is an enforcer. I also want to take a moment to just talk about the way that this show does framing and editing for a second because holy shit they really go out for the scenes with Caitlyn in them. They show off Caitlyn staring down her iron sights, showing her directness, being a straight shooter. This scene where Caitlyn is showering and thinking back to that moment of watching Vi walk off into the rain is so goddamn beautiful. They also use this one editing technique that I fucking love, where they'll cut between two characters in two completely different locations, but juxtapose their shots to make it seem as if they're able to see each other and even react to each other's emotions. As Caitlyn looks up at the water tower, Jinx looks down at her from her perch, and Caitlyn gasps in reaction. It's as if they can see each other despite being in completely different locations. The show does this again on the bridge. As Silco picks up Jinx's wounded body, he stares across the bridge and Vi stares back, eyes filled with regret. In reality, there's probably about 700 feet of distance and smoke between them, but it's like they're staring each other down despite neither of them being able to actually see the other person. It draws out the drama from multiple scenes at the same time in a very organic way that I find incredibly efficient and more deeply moving than if these scenes had occurred completely separately. The relationship between Caitlyn and Vi reaches a head during Jinx's tea party. Caitlyn was kidnapped shortly after she parted ways with Vi, and the both of them are forced into this twisted Sophie's choice that Jinx has set up for them. This experience is hugely impactful for Vi, but I think a lot of people forget how much Caitlyn is very much a main character in this moment also. All the answers that Caitlyn was searching for have brought her to this moment. The Shimmer plot, the stolen gemstone, Jinx, Silco, her relationship with Vi, it's all coming together in this crazy moment. I wanted to bring up that shower scene again because Jinx's arrival is honestly so fucking spooky. But I realized something funny after the fact. The next time we see Caitlyn is during the tea party scene where she's fully dressed in her enforcer's uniform. Jinx saw Caitlyn naked before Vi did. <laughs> Either Jinx watched Caitlyn get dressed at gunpoint, or knocked her out and dressed her herself. Both ideas which are stupidly silly to imagine. Once Caitlyn breaks free of her restraints, I love that she gets the drop on Jinx. Jinx is a psychotic terrorist who's killed innocent people, stolen a piece of dangerous technology, and is currently holding her and her girlfriend hostage. Caitlyn is fully within her right to gun Jinx down, but she hesitates. Not because she doesn't want to kill Jinx, but because she cares about how that would affect Vi. But her hesitation costs her dearly. 
Caitlyn's affection for Vi ultimately costs her everything when Jinx pulls that trigger during the finale. All of the answers that Caitlyn sought throughout her journey are now right in front of her, as are the smoldering ruins of her old life. And what Caitlyn does with those answers will decide what comes next for Piltover. Curiosity is the death of ignorance. Why do we say the things we say? Why do we assume the worst from people we don't know? Why do we hate what we don't understand? Asking questions is the thing that keeps our world moving forward. When you're a child, you have all these questions. Why is the sky blue? Why is the grass green? Why is the sun bright? Stuff like that. But as we get older and we learn more, we stop asking questions because we start to assume that we know everything that we need to know. But the older you get, the more questions you should be asking. Bigger questions. Like, why do we dislike people from places we've never even been to? Why are the police so aggressive? Why do we accept the status quo? Why are we so afraid of asking questions? Sometimes the answers are scary, but not wanting to know is worse than not asking why in the first place. Caitlin's story is so important because it revolves around questioning society at large, and more importantly, why you believe what you believe. Critical thinking is a skill that not everyone has. It's like a muscle. If you don't use it, you start to lose it. You have to train yourself to pay attention to the things that people say and do. It's hard, but nothing good ever came easily. I'm guilty of being ignorant of how the world works. Everyone is. Ignorance is normal, and no one is born knowing everything they'll ever need to know about the real world. But as long as you stay curious and keep asking questions, the less ignorant you'll be. There's a reason why the people in power prefer you to be uneducated. People who don't ask questions are easier to control. The more you learn, the more powerful you are. Like Caitlin, you can never stop learning to be a smarter, wiser, better person. I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to anyone who sat through and watched this entire video on Caitlyn. I think she's a pretty underrated character, and I spent a lot of time on this project, and I'm pretty proud of how it turned out. Please like and subscribe, and support us on Patreon, where you can get access to our uncensored videos, outtakes, short videos, and exclusive idle chats, where two or more of us hang out and talk about the media that we're passionate about. Thanks again so much for watching. This is the Hedgehog from Idle Scree, signing off.